Hey guys, my name is Victoria. I'm a rhetoric major at Georgia College with a political science minor. I decided to title my project Shakespeare in Politics. I'm going to explain to you guys why I chose this, explain the ways in which his plays are political, and then explain to you why it matters from a theatrical standpoint. So I'm sorry about not being on camera today. I've had a lot of allergy issues. My eyes are just not pretty, so I decided to spare you. I hope you enjoy my voice and these stolen unsighted pictures from the internet. Now, as a former English major, some of my absolute favorite classes have been on Shakespeare. I love studying his plays, his life. I think he's completely brilliant. His work really transcended his era. Um, here in the West, you have movies like She's the Man, some of the more obvious but still kind of trippy adaptions, like the 90s Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, it's just his influence is everywhere. Now, 20 years ago, you know, the adaption of film, theater, whatever. Um, and you even have mo movies coming out of Bollywood and Asia all over. Shakespeare really holds influence. It's honestly a phenomenon. So one of the things that I'm most interested in and something that I find incredibly fascinating when it comes to Shakespeare is that he's often misquoted and misunderstood. So a good example of this is that ever occurring and common myth and the equally as frequently debunked myth that Romeo and Juliet is this big romantic grand story. In the end, it has a lot more to do with impulsiveness and teenage angst. Uh, so with any author, it's important to understand context, but with Shakespeare, it really makes a difference to understand his jokes, to understand what he's saying. Um, one of my favorites and one that I remember from studying Hamlet in high school is towards the end of Hamlet, and I guess there's little tips and pointers throughout, but you realize that Hamlet, or <laughs> that Hamlet, that Ophelia is pregnant. Um, she is taking a herb called rue, and rue was known as kind of the abortion herb. And so that's really, it's telling, and it's something that you honestly would have to understand context and time period and, and what that specific word meant to understand the, the story as a whole. So a lot of people think he was this really beautiful, elegant, refined writer, and maybe he was, but he was also feisty. He was crude. He was living in a time that was very censored, but he wasn't really shy about pointing out wrongdoings and speaking his mind. So he threw in a lot of digs, politically and religiously. It was a lot of pop culture, a lot of subtext, a lot of, you know, we would call it subtweeting. You start to see his strong Catholic faith through all of this. You start to see that he's fearful for England's future. He's trying to, to rally his ideas, to rally the people around him. You know, he, he's thinking things are getting dark. Um, you, you have a lot of political unrest in this time period. There was not a political consensus. Um, you obviously had a lot going on in the church. So... <laughs> Uh, the stage and these plays acted as a political platform for him to express his ideas, to state his companions, concerns, to converse, and to create this rhetoric with the audience. So I hate to, equ to equate the two things. I really do. But it kind of reminds me of South Park. So you have something that is really just this piece of entertainment, and it's kind of dressed up and hiding political commentary. The audience members who were there, they were there to be entertained, if you didn't get the joke, you were still entertained. If you did get the joke, and I guess if you agreed with his point of view, it made the show so much more substantial. It gave it a separate meaning. It was thought-provoking. For the sake of time, I want to give one example. Um, and this is an example that I thought was just really fascinating. It's small, but it's, it shows you just how frequently it occurred in his, his writing. So in Much Ado About Nothing, there's a reference to July 6th. So the Elizabethan Catholics would understand the significance of this date. So on July 6th, Thomas More, who was their chancellor, was put to death for refusing to acknowledge the monarch as the head of the church. Later on, the son's king, or the, sorry, the king's son died on July 6th. And so the Elizabethan Catholics kind of saw this as an, an omen or a warning from God. The, what the king was doing was wrong. He was going to take his son. Um, and so there's a line in Much to Do About Nothing where they're using July 6th. They're kind of teasing the hero. 
and it says, Mock not, mock not. Ere you flout old ends any further, examine your conscience. So essentially what they're saying here is, is, you know, it's not funny. So like, don't mock what happened. The death of Thomas More and Edward are not a laughing matter. So that's just one small, small little example of what I'm talking about. But honestly, when you read through Shakespeare with these political connotations in mind, it really changes the text. And you would think about how, you know, the people in the audience would really interpret this differently. And it would mean so much more to them. It would resonate with them. You would have this connection. It, it's something that's really thought provoking. And, and even though Shakespeare, you know, wasn't necessarily a political figure, he's very politically influential. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to have to wrap it up, but I really encourage anyone who is even slightly interested in these two topics and how they mesh together to research them. I really had a good time learning all of this. It's fascinating and educational. So I hope you enjoyed my little presentation. Thank you.